Good evening, dear friends. Can you believe it? It's the eighth evening of our journey with this Pentecostal theme on the topic, overall topic, what Revelation teaches us about the life and calling of the church. And this evening, we're going to read and listen to and reflect on the letter to the congregation in Philadelphia on the theme how a congregation could remain faithful and open doors with little power. But let us first pray and ask God's blessing on his word and the reflection. Father God, Thank you that you are a God of all seasons. As we experience the winter cold here in Cape Town, I thank you that I know that our God remains faithful. You have proven it over and over again throughout our lives, throughout the history, throughout the history of your church in particular, that you remain faithful faithful to us and we thank you for that especially in the time like this that we need your assurance and reassurance that we are not alone lord i pray that this evening's message of how you present to the congregation to the church an open door will be a message that we understand and interpret for our time in particular now. Lead us, Holy Spirit, to listen so that we may indeed become doers of your word. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm going to read this evening from Revelation chapter 3 and verses 7 to 13 to the church in Philadelphia. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of whom of him who is holy and true who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come to you and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I also keep you from the hour of trial that is coming, that is going to come to the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from God, from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
this is the word of the Lord. Praise be to him. And now, Lord, we ask and pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, our God, our Redeemer. Amen. You know by now that we always start by briefly looking at the city and the congregation to whom this letter is written. Not much about the city of Philadelphia. It was much younger and less known than most of the other cities mentioned in the letters here in Revelation. But the city apparently also bore the name Gate to the East. And there was this theory that the city was founded as a basis for exporting the Hellenistic culture to Asia Minor. In other words, sort of a missionary city to promote, to promote or propagate the Greek culture and values and way of life. The congregation is clearly a very small congregation. It was also not very influential in the time. John writes, the Lord says, I know that you have little power. We can assume that they also experience their share of problems like all the other congregations living in a hostile environment as a minority group. And of course, the pressure on them to participate in all the pagan festivals and rituals. And of course, added to that, as we've heard with the other congregations, also the pressure being bullied by the Jewish brothers and sisters. But this congregation is commended for two things that they did. First, the Lord honors them for holding on to his message, even in difficult circumstances. This expression is not just to indicate a defensive attitude from their side, but it can also mean that there was a readiness from the side of the congregation to seize the opportunities to witness to Jesus Christ. The act, second act for which they are honored is that they never denied the name of Christ, which of course, as we've also learned from the other congregations, was really a test for the first Christians because it was expected that everyone should honor Caesar as Lord. So if the Lord says to them, I recognize that you have never denied the name of Christ, then it is indeed a commendation, a commendation for them. But it is this small congregation that gets open doors from the Lord. Twice in this passage, verses 7 and 8, we read about open doors. And clearly it refers to opportunities for witnessing and expanding the kingdom of God. As we've said, the, the city Philadelphia was also named Gate to the East. So in a sense, the church now has an opportunity not to spread the Greek or Hellenistic culture, but to spread the gospel of Christ into Asia Minor. The first reference in verse 7, John says or refers to Jesus carrying the key of David and him unlocking or closing doors. It means that John is depicting Jesus 
as the one who has absolute power and authority on earth. He is the one to whom all power belongs in heaven and on earth. The metaphor also tells us that Jesus actually came to open doors. Yes, he can shut doors. But him opening doors is the main message and was Jesus' mission to the earth. For example, in John's Gospel, after the well-known verse 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 16, God so loved the world, verse 17 states that Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that the world could be saved by him. And that is what Jesus came to do, to open the doors for us as human beings to enter the kingdom of God. The second reference to open door is found in, 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 in verse 8, when the Lord says that he also gave an open door to the congregation in Philadelphia. In the difficult times in which the congregation lives, the Lord says, do not give up hope now. I particularly now give you an open door and opportunities to be church, to spread the gospel in word and deed. The wonderful news is that this small congregation, insignificant congregation, saw the opportunity that God was pointing and use that opportunity. That is why the congregation is praised by God. Our natural inclination, of course, let us be honest, is when we go through difficult times personally or as a church, a congregation, we tend to become very self-absorbed. Our needs, our security, our protection, receives priority and we forget that we are called not for ourselves but to be a witness and a testimony. God blesses us to be a blessing to others, to the nations. So in verse 9, just briefly mentioning this but a very important and surprise actually that the Lord promises that he will also reverse the process with the Jews. He is going to show his strength and love by repenting, the repenting of the Jews and making the Jews who had such a negative um, attitude towards the Christian faith to turn to the church of Christ and acknowledge that, Jesus, that the Lord loves this church. And that is, is really surprising. But let us look at this times of trial, the dark cloud over the congregation in that particular time. But how this time of crisis was indeed an opportunity to serve, to follow, to honor, and to confess the Lord. Unfortunately, the Lord promising open doors to the congregation did not just make it easy for them. Everything was not running smooth for the congregation. In fact, verse 10 refers to a time of trial that will come over the whole, on the whole world through which all the inhabitants of the earth will be tested. It's not exactly clear which time of trials is referred here. But most important, it is to understand that such times of suffering are a reality of our lives. We know that. We experience that. When the COVID virus comes, it does not exclude us as Christians. We have already heard and know about the death of Christian brothers and sisters, or those who have fallen ill. 
So Christians are not spared the suffering. The Lord does not stop suffering coming upon his children. But he does promise that he will hold them in a time of trial. That is what verse 10 says to us. So it is clear I'm not taking you out of the situation. But indeed, I promise you my presence and I promise that I will hold you during this time of suffering. This is so important for us in our lives, in our times. So that encourages the congregation not to be afraid. Yes, we are realistic in times of suffering and trials. But we are not afraid. We live in faith. There's another promise coming through. Times of trial and hardship are not meaningless. It's not empty times. It does not mean that we must sit and do nothing during difficult times. It is exactly in difficult times that we are called to be shining lights, that we are called to be the salt of the earth, that we are called to be witnesses and testimonies, living testimonies of Jesus Christ. This is such a relevant message for us in this particular time in South Africa and the world. So God praises them that they held on to the message of perseverance in suffering because the church understood that the message of Jesus, of Jesus' life was a message not separated from suffering and pain. Even Jesus' first disciples did not understand it when he started talking about his, the suffering and his death. But this congregation clearly understood that. The congregation also began to understand that times of trial in our lives were in no way detached from our missional calling and the task of the congregation. It is not true that our missional calling is not suspended for a time when we are put to rest. In a strange way, God says to us, I'm using times of trial and suffering for you as an open door to bring my message, to live my message out for people to see. Even scholars who write about the early church history points out to the fact that even when the early church experienced and went through epidemics, their witness, their living testimonies, their taking care of people in need, actually led to the growth of the church. Because people became aware of the fact that these people of faith are different. They have a different set of values. They can see things that we can't see. They have a hope that we don't have that we don't have. And that translated in them being compassionate people in a time when most people think only about themselves. Again, this is such a relevant message for us as we wrestle with the question how to be church in the time of COVID and lockdown. So this is the, the core of the message tonight. 
that this congregation of Philadelphia was small, insignificant, not powerful, but they were faithful. They hold on to their faith. They continue to be church. And God opened opportunities for them, a door for them. And it ends also with promises for this congregation. The first promise is that those who endure, I will make you temples, pillars in the temple. And scholars of the word says it's significant for these people because the city of Philadelphia was hit by earthquakes so many times that the people used to live outside the city for their own safety. So to, to hear about the firmness of the temple and pillars was not only a great attraction for these Christians, but also a deep assurance that they are secure in the Lord. The second promise that is added has to do with names and new names. Jesus promises to write the name of God on them. Wow. I will write the name of my God on you to show them that they belong to God forever. And again, as a small community within the city who did not always have access or were denied access, who were not always recognized, they hear this word, the name of God will be written on you. It must have been a great comfort to the congregation members. And then Jesus promises to write his own name on them. The new name of Jesus. And by that he says, you have identity. You are a people with an identity. Remember that when it's difficult times for you. But also remember that when you go out. Because you don't just go out on your own, but in my name. Even, and I want to end off with this, even the name of this congregation, Philadelphia, which means the love for brothers, literally brothers and sisters, one can say, was the challenge to them in a sense. And they took the challenge and they lived this challenge to show the love of God to brothers and sisters, even those outside the congregation. So this is such an inspiration for us in a time like this to reach out to people with the love of God in our hearts. We cannot do that if God's love is not in us, in our community of believers, in our churches. But it's love that drives us, that urges us, that compels us, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. And that is my prayer for all of us as congregations, as churches in a time like this, that we will, compelled by the love of Christ, reach out to everyone in need. May God help us. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you for inspiring us with this message and letter to the congregation in Philadelphia. Thank you that you are encouraging us that we don't have to be powerful to be faithful. And thank you that you tell us that even in the midst of trials and difficult times, you present to us opportunities, open doors to be your testimonies, your witnesses. 
And as we approach Pentecost Day and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we remember the words and promise of Jesus to his disciples. I will give you the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses. And as the disciples said, still not understanding what this means, but at the same time, pray, prayfully, prayfully waiting on that promise. Help us, Lord, to wait with expectation also so that your transforming power, Holy Spirit, will also change us from fearful, frightened disciples to powerful witnesses of your kingdom, of your gospel, Lord Jesus. We ask this in your name. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and remain with you this evening, tomorrow and every day of your lives until Jesus comes again. Amen.